The following presentation is made possible through the generosity of Lifehouse Fellowship partners and friends. As I was preparing for this service, I was in a meeting and I heard the Lord say these two words. And I believe these two words are an anthem as we lead into the year of 22. Can you believe that we're already heading into 2022? It is amazing. 21 has flown by. And uh, how many of you know you can't keep a good man down? The enemy has thrown his best punch. He keeps throwing punches, but we keep deflecting them. We put on the whole armor of God. That way we, way we may withstand all the fire darts of the wicked one. And we just want to say that you can do it. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You're the head, not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. Everything you set your hand to do prospers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm a child of God. I'm a king's kid. I tell you what, I don't have to run around with the, with the beggars and the orphans, but you know, I've been translated. I'm no longer an old man. I'm a new man. The old man is gone and the new has come. I get to sit at the king's table. I get to sit at his right hand. Oh, hallelujah. We're not down here, the beggarly elements of the world. No, but I've been seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Someone say amen. Amen. So I said all that to get us to these two words. I was in this meeting and, and I heard these two words. And these two words have been ringing in my spirit. These two words have <coughs> caused me to ask the Lord, what are you doing? Because it is, is inspirational. When you hear these two words, I believe it's going to be a life change. I believe you're going to see yourself in, in, under a new dimension, under a new, under a new covering, under a new, uh, 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 under a new vision, so to speak, under a new uh, just just freshness and a fresh fire when you hear these two words. <laughs> I need some water. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Apologize about that. <clears throat> But there are two words, two words. Someone say two words. I think can change your life. I think can change the way you see this upcoming year. <clears throat> Some of you have been in a, in a rut. Some of you have been in a place where you've needed God to answer some prayers. Some of you have been in a place where you need 22 to be different than what it was like in 21. You need 22 to be different than what it was like in 2020. Some of you have been in a spiritual rut for years upon years upon years. And the Lord is saying to you that he has given you great grace. Those are the two words. Great grace. Great grace. Now I want you to turn. Now as I heard those words, as I was praying over you, and I was praying over our church, and as I was praying over our leadership and praying over the directives that the Lord has given us and the doors that he's op opened for us to walk through, I kept hearing the words, great grace. Great grace. Now, grace in itself is awesome. 
But great grace? Wow. I believe God's trying to tell us something. Now turn over your Bibles, if you will, with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're going to turn there and uh, we're going to we're going to read a few verses of scriptures here. Acts chapter 4. I'm not going to keep you long today. Acts chapter 4. Hallelujah. Say this with me. Great grace. Great grace. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart. I'm going to start in verse 32. I apologize. Verse 32. Because there's a prerequisite that has to take place <coughs> for great grace. Excuse me. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul, neither did anyone say that any of these things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Notice how they were, they had one heart, they believed in one heart. They, uh, they were all in unity. No one's possessions were just theirs. No, but the possessions were for everyone. And they all had things in common. Which mean they were, they, they were of like-minded spirit. And they had great power. You know where you know where the Bible says where how can two walk together unless they be in agreement? You know agreement brings forth great power. The Bible says one will put two, one put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. When when you by yourself you're powerful, but what happens when you start linking arms? When you start getting uh, the body of Christ? You link arms with the body and you start walking in agreement and you start walking in, in unity, one heart, one mind, one soul, heading toward seeing Jesus high and lifted up, being a part of the body of the, of, in, in, in this last time, end time move of his spirit, being a part of revival, being a part of his spirit. What you are saying is, I'm not going to be a bone on my own, but I'm going to get a part of the body of Christ. And I'm going to link up my faith, my unity, my spirit with your spirit. And what it's going to do, it's going to bring great power, which produces great grace. Now, let's talk about great grace. I hope you can look back on seasons or situations in your life and say with me that that was grace. I look back over our ministry over the last 12, 13 years, and I think about how we've come this far. And I keep hearing the Lord say, it was nothing but by grace. It's nothing that Jeremy Sutton could do. Now, he has to use a vessel, and I'm a willing vessel, meet for the master's use. But let me tell you, I had to get in tune with him. I had to get in tune with his spirit. I had to jump in the flow. Come on, somebody. And so, it, but when I offered my life, when I offered my heart, when I offered my family, and said, Lord, we'll go where you tell us to go. We'll do what you tell us to do. We'll, 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 we'll love who you called us to love. And when we said that, God began to pour out his grace upon us. And over the years, I've seen grace upon grace upon grace. But I'm telling you, we are entering into a season of great grace. Hallelujah. Now, 
that was great grace. But when we should have been buried under grief, when we should have been buried under pressure, and when our lives should have been done away with, and when, when, when people said, you can't, when people, you know, tried to pull the rug out from underneath us, how many times God's grace was there. Hallelujah. We should have been buried. We should have been persecuted for the pressure to, to make the hard decisions and, or persecution for following our convictions. I'm telling you, there are many times that I've been convicted about things and my conviction, people have, have said, you know, uh, I can't follow any longer. And that's fine. But even, though, even in those seasons, God's grace has come upon my life. God's grace has come upon our life. God's peace in those seasons held us right in the middle of the storm. God's, God's love held us right in the middle of persecution. God's love held us right in the middle of where we was seeking the Lord for the next step. Someone say, great grace. God always turns your mourning to dancing. He always turns your sorrow to joy. He always turns the darkness to light because that's who he is. That's what he does. By definition, that is a, that's great grace. But let me tell you what it means in Greek. It describes grace as a few ways. It describes in the Greek language, when you hear the word grace, you can hear it also referred to as favor. 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 Done for someone without any expectation getting something in return. How many of y'all have ever received favor? Well, that's grace. Which is the same reason why grace was given by God and received by man through his son Jesus. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for unmerited favor. Thank God for his grace that came down in the form of a man in the name of in, in his son Jesus. That when we called unto him, he answered us and he came to live big in our hearts. Another definition that piggybacks right along with the Greek de definition is the reality of that when grace is received by faith, it completely transforms a person and causes them to love God in return because, of course, God first loved us. The point is that grace is help in the time of need. It's something we can't conjure up on our own. Grace is divine help. Not only is grace unmerited favor, not only is grace getting what I don't deserve, grace is. Grace is help in the time of need. It's something we can't, we can't make up, okay? So now add the word great to it. You know what grace means. Now you add the word great to it. And what do we have? It's not hard to define great. It means a larger magnitude, a larger number, a larger size or amount. Therefore, great grace is the superabundant supply of God's help in the time of need. Someone say amen. amen. Praise God. And I kept hearing those words, great grace. Great grace. And I speak that over you now, church. Great grace. James chapter 4 
6 and 7. <coughs> Who is grace afforded to? I believe grace is afforded to all who walk in humility. And so I just want to say this. You are here not on your own accord. You are here under the mighty hand of God, and he puts you right here in this place for this time. The money you make, the clothes you wear, the cars you drive, is because of God's grace. Come on, somebody. James chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, but he gives a greater grace. Someone say, greater grace. To those, therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So what do we have to do? We have to be, we have to be humble. In everything, we have to approach it with humility. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. This is a sign of humility. Cleansing your heart. Cleansing your hands. Purifying your hearts. And stay single-minded. You want to remain humble? Draw near to God. Keep in a constant pursuit towards him and his presence. Cleanse your hands. If you've fallen, if you've messed it, if you, hey, we all miss it. The righteous fall, the Bible says in Proverbs, the righteous fall seven times, but seven times the righteous man gets back up. When you, when you fall, get back up, wipe the dirt off of you, go Go, go repent and let's keep going. Don't stop when you fall. Come on. Purify your hearts. How do I walk in purity and holiness? The Bible says, be holy for I'm holy. As you walk in holiness, you're walking in purity. I tell you what, and when you're living in his presence, you can't help but live in his holiness. When you're, when you're pursuing his presence, you can't help but walk in purity. You can't help but think the way he thinks. You can't help but talk the way he talks. You can't help but to act the way he acts because you're in his presence. See, that's purifying yourself. When I get into the word, the Bible says that, that my mind is being washed through the washing of the water of the word. And I'm becoming more pure. I'm becoming more holy and becoming more like him. So I've got to be a person of the word. I've got to be a person of his presence and understand and know that if I want to walk in humility, I have to be, pe I have to be a person that's in pursuit of his presence. Someone say amen to that. The last thing here in James he talks about, and I think this is where a lot of people miss it. If you want to know it, where a lot of people miss it, they miss it right here when he says you double-minded <clears throat> you double-minded there's a lot of double-minded Christians in the earth today they're being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine they're being tossed to and fro with with, with whether or not they want to keep doing with what, what they know to do they're being tossed to and fro with their convictions. That, you know, uh, I've, I've heard it time and time again. God, God wants people with a backbone. He wants people who will stand up for righteousness. He wants people with, that will hold up the standard of Jesus and, and lift up his name and make his name great. No more double-mindedness, church. No more double-mindedness. We drive, draw, have to draw a line in the sand and say, I will not relent when it comes to the things of God. I will stay single-minded. I will not be tossed with every, uh, uh, every, okay, I'm going there. Conspiracy theory, 
that comes down the turnpike, I'm not going to be tossed and double-minded in that. No, I'm going to stay a, be a person of grace. I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to stay in a place where I'm pursuing God's presence. I'm going to cleanse my hands and stay single-minded about the things of God and what he wants to do in this season. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, and I read it over there in Acts chapter 4. The, one of the great things that, that came upon, the reason why they functioned in great grace is because they were people of unity. So no longer does God, <clears throat> so no longer does God want you to be a bone on your own. This is a season of, of coming together, attaching yourself with the body of Christ. Isolation is not of God. Isolation is not of God. And I want to tell you, if you think you can do church on your own, you don't, you don't need the body of Christ. You don't need a pastor. You are thoroughly mistaking yourself. I've buried so many people this past year that I don't even like to even think about it. But one of the things that I've known and what's been so precious is that the ones that came to me were the ones in the funerals I performed were the ones of the, of the, of the precious saints in our, con in our congregation. I knew them. I knew their heart. I knew they had a love for the Lord. You don't need no preacher. You don't need just someone to be an attaboy, uh, someone that'll be a yes man in your life. You need a pastor who can correct you and tell you when you missed it and get up in your junk <clears throat> with love. But every one of these people were a part of this body. And we got to celebrate their life. They weren't isolated. How many people stepped into eternity and nobody even knew? How many people stepped over into the next life? Isolated and alone. That's sad to me. That's sad. Be a person that's about unity. Be a person that's about coming together. Why? Because great grace is upon you when you do. Unmerited favor. Another thing that we can learn, one of the byproducts of operating in great grace is you get to walk in great boldness. I'm here today, we're ministering this message, and I get to stand up here and minister the love of Christ, but I do it with a bold heart, with a bold spirit. Not shaking, not wondering if Jesus is for me. Let me tell you, he's for me. And let me tell you, he's for you. And let me tell you, he's called you for such a time as this. He's poured his grace upon you for boldness to rise up in you so you can be a light to those that are lost around you. No greater example than the Apostle Paul. You know, the Apostle Paul was a was a he, he was a he was a whiz kid. He was smart. He knew the law. He, he, he executed justice for the law and judgment on people, killing Christians 
by the tens and dozens until he had a road of Damascus experience. And when, when Jesus met him and when Jesus had the encounter with Paul and bright light shone upon Paul and, and he said, Paul, why do you kick against the goads? Why, why are you kicking against my, my people? Why are you kicking against my plan and my purpose? Paul has a conversion. And I think there's a many of you today that you have, you have a saw, a heart, where you've been kicking against the things of God. And the Lord's saying, great grace has come upon you. Great power, great unity has come upon you. It's time to walk in that. Quit kicking against my plan. Quit kick, kicking against my vision. Quit kicking against my will for your life. Hey guys, this is Pastor Jeremy Sutton here at Lifehouse Fellowship Church. Thank you for tuning into our broadcast today. What a privilege it is to come into your home to minister the uncompromising Word of God. I believe as the Word went forth, it challenged you. Also in the challenge, it also may have confirmed some things in your life. And, and it's in our honor and our privilege to, to just bring the word for such a time as this. We know that the word is what's going to help us in these season, in these times. And so you may have been listening to me today and saying, I need to get back into the game. I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. And I want to just pray a simple prayer. Would you pray with me to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you say it with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Fill me. I repent of my sins. Be the Lord of my life from this day forward. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, would you do a couple of things for me? I would certainly appreciate it. Number one, would you go to our website at lifehousefellowship.net and hit the connect link and fill out that digital connect card. We would appreciate it. Number two, you can give us a call at 432-262-LIFE. We want to get a staff member talking to you to help you on your next steps with Jesus. Our broadcasts are made possible by the love gifts of our friends and partners. And we're asking you, would you come and be a partner with us? Down below are the options for you to sow into this ministry. Your gift gives us the ability to go into homes just like yours and minister love, hope, and healing to bring life and life everlasting to those that are needing a touch from the Father. Thank you so much for your gift today. We certainly do appreciate it. Until we connect again, remember, great days are here and greater days are ahead.